Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. This one written by Danny, read by me, the Lost Boy Larry broadcast. Let's just jump into it, shall we? If you're new here, former of the show, I've never read this before. We're going to explore it together. So let's go back to the 1970s, shall we? On August the 12th, 1973, one of the biggest and most expensive search and rescue operations ever witnessed in the United States at the time came to a close after four grueling days. A cry for help from a terrified seven-year-old known largely as Larry had first been picked up purely by chance on Citizens Band Radio and sparked immediate public panic as the boy appeared to be trapped and fighting for his life in an upturned truck following a terrible accident in the remote wilderness. The messages oh my god this is crazy this is what the, the truckers have those radios in their in their cars right so is that like is what a relative like driving him and then they've been in a crash and he's dead and the kid's like uh i gotta use that radio i guess that's intense i'm really hoping that this is just a prank a terribly terribly tasteless prank the messages kept coming through on cb radio for several days as the search for lost boy larry evolved into a massive operation spread out across the state of new mexico involving hundreds of police officers national guardsmen and civilian volunteers along with the deployment of no less than 22 planes although not all of them made it back to the ground in one piece oh my lord if that's a prank this is so expensive someone's going to prison <laughs> But after four days of frenzied activity and international headlines, the search for Lost Boy Larry just ground to a halt. And this wasn't because they'd found him, it's because police decided that they were no longer entirely convinced that Lost Boy Larry ever existed. It sounded more like somebody was just having a bit of a laugh at somebody else's quite considerable expense. <laughs> yeah, at the taxpayer's considerable consent, uh, expense. God damn. Over 50 years later, we've yet to find any trace of either Lost Boy Larry or the perpetrators of an elaborate hoax which has since become the most widely accepted explanation. But is there more? To the story than that. There were certainly plenty of suspicious elements in the saga which didn't quite add up, but there are also plenty of questions which have never been satisfactorily resolved and several troubling points that don't appear to have been fully considered at the time. So if everyone out there has got their ears on, it's high time we quit the jabbering and put some go-go juice in this wiggle wagon as we tune into the brain-pickling story of Lost Boy Larry and try to get a handle on, on whether he was a fictional creation of a no-good cotton dropper sending us all on a wild goose ch chase or a real seven-year-old boy crying out for help that tragically never came S seeing as it's been 50 years and i assume they've not found an overturned truck with the skeleton of a boy inside that it was a prank right a, a, a very very tasteless prank you're taking away like people who should be doing other shit. like i don't know police officers i don't know going around and doing violence or something like they should be doing that they shouldn't be like out searching for people who aren't real have you ever wanted how to keep your skin feeling as fresh and as radiant as you are? Well, listen up, because today's sponsor, Foreo Sweden, has the answer, because this is the UFO3, the ultimate deep facial hydration device. Now, look, I'm not exactly a skincare guru. I make fact videos, not beauty videos. But even I know that hydrated skin is happy skin. And that's where the UFO3 comes in. It's not just a device. It's basically like a spa day for your face. The UFO3 increases skin moisture by a whopping 126% in two minutes. That's quicker than brewing your morning coffee and guess what it's more effective than a sheet mask alone in fact it's clinically proven to reduce the appearance of wrinkles in just one week so what's the secret sauce to this thing then well the ufo3 combines warming thermotherapy cooling cryotherapy and full spectrum led therapy to give you the ultimate skincare experience and here's the kicker ufo3 has an easy mode for when you're on the go just press a button and voila customized treatments at your fingertips plus you can customize your skincare routine with a foreo app guides you through treatments making your skincare routine a breeze whether it's a gift for you or your significant other i got my wife one of these after she saw me using it it's a great thing to buy for has a special offer for you click the link below to get a 30 percent discount on the ufo3 and if you use the code 10 decoding you'll get an additional 10 percent discount and don't wait because this offer is for the first 50 people only you don't want to miss out on it if you want your skin to look as fabulous as you are yes thank you for for sponsoring and now back to today's episode smoky signals the very first message from Larry was picked up by CB enthusiast Darlene Ross of Fontana in California on Tuesday, August the 7th, 1973. While the CB craze was already in full swing in the US during the 1970s, by which time CB radio was installed in trucks as standard, it took a little while longer to get going here in the UK, where CB radio didn't even become technically legal until 1981. Not that this had dissuaded earlier use of the land mobile radio system from rebellious UK citizens who had been watching too many Smokey in the 
the Bandit movies. What? I don't, what, I don't even know what CB radio is. I assume... I, I, I mean, I've heard of it. I just thought it was what trucks used to talk to each other. This was a craze? I, I mean, yeah, maybe for, like, boomers. <laughs> My older brother briefly had a CB set up in his bedroom in the mid-1980s for reasons that I never quite understood. On the very rare occasion I was allowed to have a play with it, it was only under close supervision of my brother and on the strict condition that I proudly adopt the handle of Little Tosspot. <laughs> I mean, I get it. Like, this is a radio, right? That you can tune into and chat with other people. It's sort of like having the. It's sort of like um, what's that website where you randomly connect with strangers and it shows the video feed and then people are showing each other of their penises. Got something for you. No. Yeah. Uh, like I don't want to name it in case I get it wrong. Is it called a Megal? Is that right? A Megal? A Megal? Something like this? This is what people did for entertainment before the internet. God, can you imagine living in those times? It'd be miserable. That probably explains why nobody ever spoke to me. So it's not something I had much of a chance to get into before my brother sold it all to buy a crap motorbike or something. But Darlene Ross was probably more of a serious CB specialist than my brother, who usually just enjoyed insulting strangers in the safety of his bedroom. And Darlene became increasingly worried when she picked up a broadcast that she most definitely wasn't expecting. Buried deep within the usually incomprehensible CB conversations involving bears with ears, checkpoint charlies, flying donuts, foxes in the henhouse, and kojaks with a kodak, Darlene accidentally stumbled upon the first message from a distressed young boy in need of immediate assistance from a grown-up. I mean, I know we're making fun of the people with these, like, CB radio handles, but this is basically just gamer tags. <laughs> But like back in the day, we don't and less fun. We don't appear to have access to a single recording of one of the boys' many broadcasts heard over the next five days or so, and we're entirely reliant on the word of CB users who claim to have picked them up. In this original case, the details picked up by Darlene Ross were scarce, but cause for immediate concern. The first four words she heard faintly coming through the receiver from a young male voice were "Help." please help me. After engaging with the user, Darlene was able to ascertain that the boy had been traveling in a red pickup truck with his father, who had suddenly collapsed at the wheel and hadn't moved since the truck crashed, leaving the boy alone and afraid. The boy didn't seem immediately keen to offer his name or his location, but after a little gentle prodding, Darlene encouraged him to reveal that his name was Larry and that the truck had been traveling through the state of New Mexico, a fair old distance of around a thousand miles from where Darlene was picking up his messages in California. Yeah, it's like, oh, we're somewhere in New Mexico. Mexico. New Mexico is one of the big states, right? There's loads of desert. I've seen Breaking Bad. Like, New Mexico is large. He also seemed to be under the impression that his father had suffered a fatal heart attack. That's a big jump for a seven-year-old. It was often difficult for Darlene to understand exactly what Larry was saying, as the signal was weak and his words were punctuated by relentless sobbing. At one point, she believes that she heard the boy exclaim to somebody else, Come on, David, help me. It's not unclear whether Larry was talking to a third party in the vehicle or addressing the man slumped at the wheel. Well, no, because it'd be like, Dad? Dad! My, my, my kids don't call me Simon. Although I do have a friend and his kids call him by his name, like Homer in The Simpsons. It's kind of weird. <laughs> Although the latter would be a weird way to address your own dad, particularly if you thought he was dead. Yes, I suppose it's possible that he may have just been addressing somebody else in a separate conversation on the same CB channel, or even that he was just a bit confused about Darlene's name. I mean, Darlene, David, not really. The kid had already revealed that he was only seven years old and he wasn't exactly in the best position for clear thinking and coherent conversation. Darlene managed to calm the boy down slightly and promised that she would get help before the signal gradually faded and lost boy Larry fell silent. True to her word, she immediately alerted the authorities in New Mexico and gave what limited information she had to the Albuquerque Journal, the newspaper which serves the most populous city in the state, was the first to break the story the very next morning. Further reports of Larry's transmissions were to come flooding into the authorities and the press throughout this following day from truck drivers and CB operators who were convinced that they had all spoken to the stranded boy in desperate need of help. You might think that at least one of them should have been able to squeeze out more specific location details from Larry, but again, you have to remember that he was a young boy in what may have been a completely unfamiliar place. Yes, but the trucks, it's a big ass truck, right? So it's going to be somewhat close to a road, even if it's come off and crashed. And let's say it's a really bad crash. It's not bad it's not bad enough to have like moved the father's body or knocked the kid around. So be like, yo, kid, go up to the road. I'll be rating right here. I'm not going anywhere. Go up to the road and look for a mar marker. It's just look for a sign at the side of the road. Look for anything that is different and just tell that to me and I'll pass that on to the police and we'll go, come and find you. Just go find that. Come back here. Tell me it. Boom. 
To be honest, even today, if you took me several miles away from my Cornish village and asked me to describe my current location to somebody on the phone, I'd probably just end up making confused squawking noises. I can't imagine how I would have coped at the age of seven. I was really impressed the other day. I was in a, the other day, it was like several months ago, maybe even last year. Definitely last year. Like, it was maybe, let's say it's a year ago. It doesn't even matter, Simon, why are you specifying this? Just go with a bloody story. Uh, my wife and I were in a minor car accident. Not our fault, someone just pulled down, scraped the side of our car up. And you're supposed to call the police. I think in England, you're just. I've never been in an accident where I've needed to exchange insurance details like that. But in England, I feel like we're just exchanging insurance details and be like, "Tallyo, see you later." I mean, not, but like, hopefully, never see you ever again. Just some money from an insurance company. What? What? Uh, but so you're supposed to call the police. My wife calls the police, like the the city police or whatever. And they're like, "Where are you?" And she's like, "I'm on the street." And they're like, "Are you outside number 14?" And I just looked over and it's like absolutely bang outside number 14. I'm like, wow, police have got some really good location stuff somehow. I was very impressed by this. Because I always thought like if you called the police, you'd have to describe where you are. And it's like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm in a street, but they know where you are. It's quite cool. Larry wasn't exactly helping matters by constantly changing channels on his dad's CB radio in the truck. It's not clear if he was doing this out of fumbling panic or if he felt like it was the smart thing to do whenever he lost the signal. But it was making fluid conversation very difficult for other CB users attempting to connect with him as they were only gathering small fragments of information from Larry before he disappeared to try his luck on another channel. Early suspicion had already been aroused in some quarters by just how far Larry's transmissions were stretching. Citizen band radio is meant to be used for short-distance radio communications with the local crowd, and he wouldn't usually expect a broadcast to be picked up in an entirely different state. It was already, yeah, I mean, broadcasting over a thousand miles from a truck, isn't that quite far? It was already weird that Larry's original message, presumed to have been broadcast somewhere near New Mexico, had traveled all the way to California, but it was about to get even weirder. Reports were coming in that Larry had engaged with CB operators in New Mexico, California, Arizona, Wyoming, Mississippi, and even Canada. Nor New Mexico's like in the south, right? Because I know this from Breaking Bad, it's right, it's right in the south. Canada's really far north. I don't know how far away California, they said a thousand miles, didn't they? I don't think CB radios are designed to go that far. Spectix found it a bit fishy that one boy's broadcasts could be traveling such a relatively huge distance and suspected that something else may be going on here. But it's not out of the question that Larry was unwittingly broadcasting to a much wider audience than you would usually expect, although the idea of him reaching Canada is probably pushing credibility a little too far. When the atmospheric conditions were absolutely right, CB enthusiasts back in the day could take advantage of a phenomenon known as ionospheric skip, in which the radio impulse would hit the ionosphere and then get ricocheted back down to Earth in broadly the same region, but often a surprisingly long distance from the original broadcast. On such days, CB users would amuse themselves by seeing just how far they could skip their transmissions. And it's reported that during these five days, in August 1973, the weather conditions were indeed favorable for an ionospheric skip, which could potentially have bounced back Larry's broadcasts right across southwestern America and a little beyond. The phenomenon may have been relatively rare, but it certainly wasn't unprecedented. Another point which raised suspicion is that Lost Boy Larry didn't always seem to stick to the exact same story. The majority of reports from people who claimed to have conversed with him now indicated that Larry was trapped in the upturned red pickup truck from which he could not escape, whilst his dead father was slumped in the driver's seat right next to him. I mean, if you've got enough time, surely you can escape from a... Although people do get trapped in their cars, don't they, with their seatbelts on and stuff, and then they have to be wait to be rescued, but that's got to be pretty rare. But definitely possible, so that's fine. In other variations of the story, Larry was standing outside the same upturned red truck whilst his father was trapped inside but still breathing. Much later on, a rescue worker claimed to have made contact with the boy who gave his name as David rather than Larry, which is curious as it harks back to the mention of a David during the original conversation with Darlene Ross. Here's what I speculate. Larry, whoever he may be, is a troublemaker and David is a co-conspirating troublemaker. And he at one point says to David, 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 come and help me. Like, not realizing the microphone was on or ever while he's doing this prank. And then David later takes over the microphone while Larry's away, and David accidentally says his name is David. <laughs> he's like, yeah, it's David. Oh. oh, God, I'm screwed. Was there another child at the scene called David? Was the boy unsure about his own name, or at least reluctant to give it out to strangers? Or was his full name Larry David? <laughs> <laughs> as far as full names go, that one's pretty good. Pretty, pretty, pretty good. 
This lack of consistency cast doubt over the authenticity of the distress call, although, again, it could be argued that the young boy was traumatized and confused, or even that his situation had changed over the passing hours. Maybe he managed to climb out of the truck and realize that his dad might not be quite so dead after all. If anything can be described as a single definitive account of Larry's situation, it probably stems from the regular conversations he had throughout Wednesday with a CB operator by the name of Linda King, better known by a handle of blue eyes. I've got to admit that blue eyes sounds a bit more impressive than little tosspots. <laughs> Linda managed to keep Larry talking on the same channel for longer than most, and it appears that she managed to gain the boy's trust to some degree. According to blue eyes, Larry's father had taken his young son on some kind of hunting trip through an area of wilderness somewhere near the New Mexico mountains when he had suffered a heart attack at the wheel and crashed the truck, which then flipped over into a ravine. <laughs> God damn. The father was now almost certainly dead, whilst Larry was trapped inside the upturned truck with no food or water. Larry also admitted to Blue Eyes that he didn't really know how to properly operate the CB, which suggests that the constant channel hopping was down to fidgety panic rather than calculated decision. Yet although Blue Eyes had managed to build up trust with the boy, he still point-blank refused to give his last name, which was making the case difficult for the authorities in terms of identifying a missing boy and figuring out where exactly his dad might have taken him to shoot rabbits. Oh, this whole time I'm thinking his dad's a truck driver because he's got a CB radio in his truck, but they're just they just did a regular truck because we also call trucks in the uk i know americans call trucks pickup trucks that's what we call those trucks a truck to me is like um oh, what do you call them in america like an 18 wheeler like a oh no we call those lorries what the f a truck <laughs> I don't, i'm so lost but he's not a truck driver okay the long list of reported conversations had led the authorities to conclude that larry was most likely somewhere in new mexico guys how hard is it to outsmart a seven-year-old come on now there's someone at the police who could get his last name, surely. <laughs> but New Mexico is a pretty big state, and it so far had proved impossible to get any further details from Larry, which might help pinpoint his precise location. Still, they clearly couldn't just shrug this one off, at least not for another four days. Needle in a haystack. By late Wednesday morning, three separate independent searches were already underway in New Mexico, overseen respectively by the New Mexico State Police, the New Mexico Wing Civil Air Patrol, and the Albuquerque Citizens Radio Association. Dedicated listening stations were set up across New Mexico and neighboring states to try and pick up further transmissions from Larry. The Civil Air Patrol flew planes equipped with direction finders over southern New Mexico and southeastern Arizona, while the state police and the Citizens Radio Association prepared to search sections of remote mountainous terrain on foot. The New York Times reported that three of the Civil Air Patrol pilots spotted an abandoned truck on the east face of the Manzano Mountains, but it seems that when a helicopter was later dispatched to the same area to check it out, no traces of the truck could be found. Later that afternoon, radio operators from Albuquerque, Moriarty, and Cedar Crest reported that Larry's radio signals appeared to be coming from somewhere just south of an old concrete plant in Tajeras Canyon. Planes, helicopters, and ground searchers were quick on the scene to comb the area, whilst the New Mexico Governor Bruce King managed to secure the services of two Iroquois helicopters and a U-21 aircraft from the Army National Guard. For a moment there, I was like, Iroquois helicopters? The Iroquois people have helicopters? And then I remember for some strange reason, America names all these like military equipment over after Native American people. So they, I don't know, how do the Native American people feel about that? It's got a, there's, isn't that, there's a bit, it's a bit weird. The U-21 was flown by guard pilot Captain Rick Tweed, who reported that he had picked up Larry's voice from the cockpit radio while flying over the area. Rick Tweed sounds like a newscaster. Rick Tweed here! <laughs> and had done his best to reassure the boy. He had told him, Are we going to get you something to eat? We're going to find you? I'm going to find you myself, and I'll get you a double mac. Sadly, Captain Rick Tweed never made that order for a double mac. When the sir, when you, if you're the people doing the prank, and the guy's like, I'm going to find you. Personally, I'm going to come and find you. I'm going to buy you a hamburger. At that point, surely you'd just feel like a mega piece of shit and be like, dude, I'm sorry. It's just a joke. It's just a prank. Hang it up, and then never mention it again, because otherwise you'll go to prison. <laughs> okay? <laughs> When the search teams arrived at the location just south of the old concrete plant, they found a few abandoned trucks and cars which looked like they'd been there for years, along with several discarded fridge freezers, but there was no sign of Larry. As darkness fell on Wednesday evening, Blue Eyes was still in regular communication with Larry, who now mentions that it had just started raining. As rain had just started to fall near the 4th of July Canyon in the Manzano Mountains, the search followed the rain for a while, this time including a Piper Cherokee, which was being flown by a certain T.C. Ashby of the Las Cruces Civil Air Patrol. 
control. Blue Eyes urged Larry to start yelling through his microphone if he caught sight of the landing lights of the Piper Cherokee, which were being turned on purely for his benefit. And sure enough, Larry began excitedly yelling that he could see the lights of the aircraft as it flew over the tiny town of Chilili. But again, there was no trace whatsoever of Larry or a truck during the subsequent search of the area on foot. As Wednesday the 8th rolled into Thursday the 9th, the story was all over the morning headlines of the international press, with some papers noting that the state police hadn't ruled out the strong possibility of a hoax. But pretty much every CB operator who had spoken to Larry remained convinced that his cry for help was utterly genuine. One unnamed army sergeant told a reporter that he had personally spoken to the boy for well over three hours and was of the opinion that this was most definitely not just a silly prank, although the state police later cast doubt over whether such a lengthy conversation had actually taken place. Why did people lie? I, I guess it's just for like in this situation. It's like, what's your motivation? It's just like, and I think it's just some people are weird and want attention. I'm not saying that that's what happens here, but I think if this was the case, it's like, what, why would you do this? And it's like, I don't know, just bored, just want attention. It's weird. I would never do this. I'd be like, no. Oh, it's bad. Meanwhile, Sergeant W.A. Schmidt of the Civil Air Patrol made it clear that any doubters might have a different perspective if they'd heard the voice for themselves. He told the press, I personally have never had any doubt that this is the real thing. I heard the kid crying. I just can't believe it isn't the real thing. As the search continued on Thursday morning, a fresh problem emerged which would seriously hamper the efforts. And that problem came in the form of pesky kids pissing about with their walkie-talkies. Since the story had been plastered all over the media, some little pranksters, and apparently some older pranksters who really should have known better, began flooding the airwaves with their own impressions of Larry's voice. Guys, come on, just in case it's real, just, just let them go and find the kid, just in case. On an even more disturbing note, some of the nastier kids were even attempting to speak to Larry directly to tell him that he was going to die. Oh my god, like another callback. <laughs> it's like this was the internet before the internet. Just people telling each other that they should die. <laughs> I was wondering. <laughs> Jesus Christ, the internet. <laughs> I was wondering for a minute why all these kids had the time for such sick pre-internet trolling when they all should have been in school on a weekday. But of course, this was early August, so everyone would have still been enjoying their super long summer vacation. Here in the relentlessly grim UK, the children only allowed six weeks of freedom in the summer, whereas US students get between two to three whole months off school. Yet another reason why I grew up in the wrong country. I mean, I went to school, we got nine weeks off, but we also had school on Saturdays throughout the whole year. So f that. But yeah, nine weeks of summer holiday was pretty good. I would have taken, what, 13, 14 weeks? Hell yeah, America! However, as far as silly pranks go, this was a pretty thoughtless and potentially life-endangering way to while away the hours of summer vacation when they should surely have been enjoying science camp or something. It was not only making it difficult for radio operators to identify which, if any, of these new voices might be the genuine Larry, it also meant that the genuine Larry was potentially getting drowned out in all the racket. At one point, Blue Eyes reported that she'd managed to briefly speak with the real Larry before he fell silent after crying, I can't hear you, blue eyes. It's too noisy. It's perhaps not too surprising that the search teams were getting pretty frustrated and desperate by this point, and they were now following up some frankly ridiculous leads. A woman from Maryland requested that the searchers in New Mexico investigate a certain road near Sandia Park as she could remember getting briefly lost there once. <laughs> what the f? What's that got to do with anything, you weirdo? What a weirdo. <laughs> A call was received from a psychic in a phone booth who passed on the vital information that her psychic powers had tracked the boy down to a road 20 miles south of Moriarty. Be like, yes, mom, yes, yes, yes. I'll absolutely be right on that. Yes, right away, I, as, as soon as I've hung up the phone. Dear crazy f people. <laughs> And a church group in Wichita, Kansas, got in touch with the search teams to announce that the truck was almost certain to be found beside a lake in Alamogordo. Their reasoning? The church group had been holding a night and day vigil for Larry, during which one of them received a message from God. Just imagine, you know what I did before with the, the hanging up on the phone? Exactly that again. All three leads were quite surprisingly investigated in full. Tax dollars at work, everybody! And all three leads were quite unsurprisingly found to be utterly useless. I can only assume that God's message got lost in translation. He may have been better off just broadcasting his handy map directions from a CB radio. Yet another problem reared its ugly head by the time we get around to Friday, August 9th. With hope fading fast and Larry's messages becoming less frequent, possibly down to the battery in the truck's portable CB finally running out of juice, the different ground search teams were now beginning to turn on each other. 
Hundreds of unauthorized civilian volunteers were now participating in the search, but as there didn't seem to be anyone properly coordinating all of this, some of the teams were choosing to search in places that had literally only just been comprehensively checked over by other groups, while certain areas had been left completely untouched by anybody. It sounds as if the frustration had really begun to boil over into suspicion and resentment under the baking heat, as the different groups began clashing with each other and generally getting right on each other's tits. As a, I don't know why there was another assumption. I don't, I don't know if Danny mentioned the time of year, but in my mind, this has all been going on in a big lorry in winter, but the reality is it's a truck in summer. I don't know why, just in my mind, it was snowy. <laughs> Maybe because people have more like accidents in the snow. A student from the University of New Mexico decided to do his own thing and fly solo when he rented a private plane worth about $18,000 to conduct an airborne search. Rented a private plane worth around $18,000? An extremely cheap plane. Oh wait, this is the 1970s. Okay, it's not so cheap. Unfortunately, it turned out he wasn't very good at flying planes, and he ended up having to make a crash landing when he completely lost control of the craft. That might have usually been considered a pretty expensive mistake to make, but he was only charged $500 for wrecking the plane, and whilst he originally paid up with money taken from his student tuition funds, he got most of it back after the Albuquerque Citizens Radio Association set up a fundraising campaign on his behalf. I'm assuming that he had a pilot's license. Also, paying the $500 doesn't seem at all unreasonable. Like, if you go rent a car and you crash the car, you're only going to be on the hook for, like, I mean, zero if you go for the extended insurance, which I never do because it's kind of super expensive. But if you... There's going to be, like, a cap. It's going to be, like, a £1,000 these days or whatever. So $500 back in the day, I mean, it's a lot, but it's not crazy. One half-promising new lead emerged on that Friday when a war veteran by the name of Frank Laughlin picked up messages from a young boy who gave the name of David, again prompting speculation that this may be the real name of the child in need of urgent help or that there was a second young boy at the scene. This David claimed he was standing outside the upturned red truck, which now had a white camper on tow. He also claimed that his father was badly hurt but still very much alive and trapped in the vehicle. The police actually got to the bottom of this one, but it sadly wasn't going to be of much help in tracking down the real Larry. They traced this particular signal to a kid in Phoenix who was just mucking about on his walkie-talkie. America, I'm beginning to wonder if you need to cut down a bit on those extended school holidays. There were to be a couple of further notable developments before the month was out. A 12-year-old child called Larry Zamanzinski from Ohio was reported missing to Santa Fe deputy police by his older brother. In fact, the older brother told police that he hadn't heard a peep from several other members of his family since they moved from Ohio to Washington over a month earlier. The Zmudzinski family had indeed gone missing, and of course, the police were quick to catch on to the Larry connection. But whilst the first name was a match, there was a pretty big difference in the age, and it seems impossible that a boy of 12 would pretend to be 7 years old. When you're that age, you're more likely to proudly draw yourself up to your full height and add on an extra year or two rather than take five off. Sure enough, it became clear that we were talking about two completely different Larrys, and the Zmudzinski family were found safe and well just two days later, having embarked upon a long camping trip without bothering to tell any of their relatives. I mean, fair enough. It's like when I go on a trip, I don't phone my family and tell them, hey, I'm going on a trip, by the way. It's like, no, I do it. Should I? <laughs> I don't think so. A little later, in August, CB operators in Colorado suspected that they might be onto something when they picked up the voice of a man who was boasting to his buddies that he'd recently pulled off a major CB radio hoax, which had completely fooled the New Mexico State Police. Although it's not clear if he explicitly referenced the Lost Boy Larry incident and was admitting responsibility, a service station operator named Robert Vetter felt compelled to intervene and directly challenge the man over the radio. In response, the disgruntled boaster threatened to track down and kill Robert better and just for good measure declared that he was also planning to kill president richard nixon and vice president spyro agnew while he was at it <laughs> okay this guy sounds nuts but again this is like the internet before the internet isn't it i'm gonna kill you and the president those latter two targets aroused the immediate interest of the fbi but the channel hopping man was never traced before he fell totally silent did the fbi have to really follow up all of that stuff because Sure, the guy's just a bit nuts. He's not, like, actually going to kill Richard Nixon. I mean, I guess he might be. They should, yeah, okay, I get why they're cautious. For his part, Robert Vetter believes that the man he spoke to was not responsible for fabricating the Lost Boy Larry story, although his reasoning doesn't quite cut the mustard for me. 
The guy who was sending him death threats on the CB radio had a Mexican accent, and Larry didn't. I mean, there's also the slight issue that the man had a man's voice, whereas Larry's was supposed to be a young child, but I would imagine that any prankster worth his salt would have taken small details like that into account before staging the hoax and maybe considered roping in a young recruit. Or you just do a child's voice. Can you do a child's voice? It's like, Mummy, I'm trapped in the truck. I don't know what to do. I'm trapped in the truck. I don't, I don't know if that's any good. It's just making my voice slightly higher and whiny. <laughs> I just imagine my kids complaining. Dad, my legs hurt. My own reason for doubting the boasts of this guy is that he sounds a bit too nutty to have pulled off such a long-running gag, and it seems unlikely that he would have had the time to spare for such small fry stuff when he was planning the assassinations of the president and the vice president. But we'll never know for certain if the anonymous guy with the Mexican accent was responsible or not, and nobody else has ever been linked to a state to staging a possible hoax. The situation was looking pretty hopeless as night fell on Sunday the 12th of august the search parties had come no closer to locating a real boy named larry who had now become worryingly quiet whilst there was still some speculation that this may have been because the cb radio battery had died there was also natural concern that larry himself had died Although four listening stations were left operating in New Mexico for several more weeks, the actual physical search was officially called off on Sunday night after four days of fruitless hunting, which had evolved into one of the biggest search and rescue missions ever seen in the U.S. at the time. The total cost for all of the hours of work undertaken by military and law enforcement personnel, along with all the planes and helicopters, was estimated to be in the region of about $120,000, which would be knocking on for nearly $850,000 in today's money. Holy f If this is a prank, you dickhead. And that's not even counting the hundreds of unpaid volunteers or the silly slot sod who crashed the private airplane. That's a pretty hefty amount of money, resources, and time invested into a search that led precisely nowhere. And the police had now clearly had enough as they called off the physical search on the grounds that the whole situation was probably just a hoax. State Police Chief Martin Vigil told a pack of assembled reporters, We have not come up with any real, definite information to establish that the situation is valid. We have not come up with any information that is definite enough to say there is actually someone out there and where this person might be. The incident was formally declared a hoax by federal and state officials in November, as Chief Martin Vigil explained, quote, We have exhausted all efforts. I think we would have found him if he had been there because all the areas that were indicated were searched extensively. Whilst it's true that the authorities were never able to come up with any information to establish the situation was valid, I'm just a little troubled that they were equally never able to come up with any information to establish that the situation was definitely a hoax. So it could be argued that the search was called off prematurely after just four days of searching, and that a seven-year-old boy was ultimately abandoned to his fate to avoid any more expense getting pissed up against the forest trees. I mean, yes, but also four days is a long time, and it's probably just a hoax. Although if it was my kid, I'd be like, get out there. Come on. Come on now. I'd be like, no, it's a hoax. It's like, no, it's my kid. He's missing. <laughs> Games without frontiers. On the face of it, a whole bunch of dodgy elements appear to point to a hoax. If Larry really wanted to be rescued, why on earth was he so stubbornly evasive about providing genuinely useful information such as his surname, and why was he making it as difficult as possible to be traced by constantly switching channels? How did the batteries of a portable CB radio manage to last? for so long. And how come nobody has ever found either Larry or his father's upside-down red truck at any point over the subsequent 50 years? Yeah, and that makes me think it's not real, because that's a really long time, and the idea that no one has stumbled across this next to a road is a bit is a bit much for me. We've already covered potential reasons for some of the more dubious parts of the story. For example, whilst some still doubt that Larry's signal could have traveled anywhere near as far as it did, the weather conditions over those five days were perfect for ionospheric skipping, which could feasibly have bounced the message much further than usual. And Larry's constant channel hopping may be explained by his admission to Blue Eyes that he didn't really know how to use a CB radio. After all, the kid was only seven, although I seem to remember that using a CB radio wasn't particularly difficult, and I was probably around the same age when I was bravely riding the airwaves under the handle of Little Tosspot. As for the surprisingly long length of the batteries, it does seem incredibly unlikely, some would say downright impossible, that the batteries in a portable CB would last the full course of five days that Larry was allegedly broadcasting his messages. But we'll come back to that thought in a moment. First, I just wanted us to consider what breed of individual would have been up to the job of staging what seems to be a pretty intense hoax. 
Just about everyone who spoke to Larry was convinced that they were talking to a genuine young kid. We obviously can't rule out the possibility that the voice belonged to an incredibly talented adult impersonator, but the general consensus seems to be that the voice belonged to a very young child, regardless of whether the actual situation was real or fictional. We already know that the police identified some of the later messages as pranks from school kids, and this may have led them to naturally conclude that the same school kids were behind the whole thing from start to finish. But there's a notable difference in the messages that were quickly identified as pranks and the messages that several CB operators believed to be the real Larry. The confirmed pranks were usually over and done within 10 minutes, and they were carried out by kids on walkie-talkies who had a bit of time to spare and who were probably starting to giggle by the end. But the potentially genuine messages were of a completely different depth. They involved a hysterical child's voice regularly sobbing and wailing in sheer distress over five days without ever once breaking out a character. I can think of more fun ways of spending my summer vacation than relentlessly sobbing into a microphone for five days. This can't have been entertaining on any level, and it would have taken remarkable level of, levels of commitment and endurance for a very young child to keep it up for so long. I think it's just someone imitating the voice, and there's two of them, so they're like splitting the duties, and they just, they're just stupid kids. I'm sure that most normal kids would have grown bored very quickly and turned their attention to something a bit more enjoyable, like memorizing entire passages from the Bible. It also feels a bit weird that such a young child would have been left unattended with the CB radio for so long to engage in conversations with strangers that in some cases are reported to have lasted for hours at a time. I know that things were different back in the 1970s when it was supposedly considered perfectly safe to send your kids off to play on the rail tracks with a flask of petrol and a box of matches, but I'm still doubtful that a little kid would have been left alone for quite so long to fake cry into a CB radio for five days. It perhaps seems more likely that a screwed up adult would have been the mastermind behind the operation. But this does beg the question as to why they'd bother unless they really had it in for the new mexico state police or they just enjoyed getting a kick out of all the drama that they were secretly creating yeah i think it's just the latter is people get a kick out of drama even when it's super pointless like this I would have thought that even a particularly twisted adult would have had far better things to do with their time, such as planning the assassinations of President Richard Nixon and Vice President Spiro Agnew. I suppose uh, it could have been the handiwork of someone who was aware of the rare opportunity to take advantage of the ionospheric skip and initially just wanted to see how far they could bounce their broadcasts, but they ended up getting a bit carried away. Of course, it would have helped the police identify a genuine missing boy if Larry had ever bothered to give his surname. This again may point to a hoax, as the prankster would have been aware that providing a surname would be game over. The situation was more likely to be dragged out for longer if the details were kept as vague as possible to perpetuate the mystery hanging over a missing boy. However, it could be the case that Larry had been taught by his parents never to give his real full name to a stranger when using a CB radio. That's fair, lots of weirdos out there. It may well be that his first name wasn't even Larry, and this was just part of the CB handle that had been taught to use at all times. I'm also quite intrigued by how frequently the name David popped up in some of the reported conversations. While some have viewed this as reference to a third person on the scene, could these have been moments when his guard slipped and he was inadvertently giving out his real name instead of his CB handle? No, because he was calling to someone like, David, help! So that implies there's someone else. It's There's, there's someone else called David, right? Right. It's also possible that Larry or David may indeed have tried to give his full name at some point, along with a bunch of other vital details, which would have helped the search, but his voice was getting lost in the cacophony of noise made by all those daft kids on walkie-talkies, which swamped the airwaves from Thursday onwards. One point that bothers me occurred during the first day of the search, when those three Civil Air Patrol pilots were reported to have spotted an abandoned pickup truck near the Manzano Mountains, yet it had completely disappeared when helicopters were dispatched to take a closer look. The only source for this comes from the New York Times, and it's not covered in much detail. It might not have happened at all, or the Civil Air Patrol pilots might have made an error and mistaken an abandoned washing machine for an abandoned pickup truck. But if it did happen, it does strike me as strange that the three pilots initially appeared to find exactly what they were looking for in the broad region that they were hoping to find it. And later that same day, Larry's reference to rain falling had led searchers to conclude that he must have been broadcasting somewhere near the Manzano Mountains. Could there have been a breakdown in communication here, or could the helicopters have failed to pick up what was glimpsed by the Civil Air Patrol pilots? Or maybe it could have just been an ice cream van which had veered dramatically off track before the driver eventually found his bearings again. Yeah, it is a bit weird, isn't it? But my gut feeling is that it just has nothing to do with it. It was some dude, like, I don't know, maybe he needed to take a sh 
So he's like, yeah, I'm just going to pull off. Just take the car into this. It's probably a truck. This is America. He's like, yeah, I could go down that like dirt road. Just going to go down that dirt road. Gets out of his car. Takes a big sh**. His, he's spotted. His car's spotted by those planes. And then he gets back in his car and drives off. Bowels relieved. Or it's an ice cream truck. <laughs> If we were going to take a tentative step into the conspiracy theorist rabbit hole, it could be argued that the authorities only wanted to wrap up the search and officially declare a hoax, without any evidence that it was a hoax, to quash any speculation that they had failed miserably in their search for a real missing child. The general public might have been a bit more reassured if they were led to believe that somebody had just been playing a practical joke rather than accept that a child had been ultimately left to die alone after the main search was called off. Well, surely at some point someone's going to be like, oh, my kid's missing. <laughs> like, my husband and my kid went, what were they doing, like fishing or some <laughs> Like, they're going to be like, they didn't come over from their fishing trip. And then they're going to be like, okay. But if there's no kid reported missing, then in a truck with a CB radio going fishing... Oh no, it was shooting rabbits, wasn't it? Like, it, it, it's not real. It's certainly quite alarming that the search appeared to descend into chaos towards the end as hundreds of volunteers started bickering amongst themselves whilst wandering around like lemmings and reportedly leaving whole sections of the region unexplored in the confusion. While some areas are getting searched for a second or third time, it's possible that Lost Boy Larry may have been awaiting in a stretch of wilderness that had been completely ignored. To be fair to the authorities who took the decision to abort the physical search, it must have been difficult to figure out what else they could realistically do after the broadcast from Larry had ceased transmission and the leads had dried up. I'm not sure if they could have carried on searching every nook and cranny of the state of New Mexico forever after everyone had just spent four days getting nowhere, and serious doubts were brewing over the authenticity of the broadcasts. But it might not have been unreasonable for the state police to take the chaotic conditions of the last few days of the search into account and perhaps consider making one last big coordinated effort rather than just shrugging and assuming that somebody out there was probably just winding them up. Still, a couple of even shadier elements of the story might lead you to conclude that the authorities made exactly the right decision in calling off the search when they did and wasting no further time and money on mischief and buffoonery. For example, when Larry told Blue Eyes that he could see the landing lights of the Piper Cherokee, you re you'd really think this would have narrowed down the search significantly, yet a comprehensive search of the whole area from which the lights could have been visible yielded absolutely nothing. Yeah, exactly. That's like really good information and they didn't find anything so it's not real. 50 years have gone by and no one's found like a 1970s pickup truck or whatever it was, you know, with a child's bones inside, as far as I'm aware. And here's the real sucker punch. In most of the broadcasts, Larry claimed that he was trapped in an upturned truck. The antenna for the CB radio would have been positioned on top of the vehicle, so if the truck really had flipped right over, the antenna would have surely been completely flattened, rendering the radio useless. Even if by some miracle it hadn't been totally destroyed, it would have been heavily damaged to the point where it would have been impossible to make any kind of broadcast, never mind a whole series of broadcasts that merrily skipped across a whole bunch of different states. So that's got to be the clincher when proving this whole story is nothing more than a whole bucket of jibber jab, right? Well, maybe. Right now, I'm like 95% sure that this is just a hoax. I really wonder if anything's going to bring me around to the other position, because it seems pretty slam dunk that this is just a hoax. Hippie hippie shake. The difficult thing here is that we don't know for sure how many of Larry's broadcasts were deemed to be potentially genuine and how many were instantly dismissed as pranks. For all we know, just a tiny percentage of the earliest broadcasts were genuine, whilst everything that followed was just other people pretending to be the real Larry. It may have even been that Blue Eyes was only ever talking at length to a prankster, and the only genuine broadcasts were the ones originally picked up by CB enthusiast Darlene Ross in California on the Tuesday night. If that were true, a bunch of bored clowns may have been partially responsible for the death of a child after leading the searchers down a series of blind alleys, not to mention the near-miss experienced by the student in the private plane. But it would also explain quite a few of the more baffling parts of the saga, such as the later inconsistencies in Larry's claims. It might also explain the puzzle over how the batteries of the portable CD radio managed to last for such an unfeasibly long time. Maybe they didn't. The batteries could have died as early as Tuesday night, after which we would have never heard from the real Larry ever again. And it might just explain how Larry was managing to broadcast radio messages using a crushed antenna on an upturned truck. 
I might be wrong on this, but as far as I've been able to make out, Darlene Ross made no mention of an upturned vehicle when she originally reported her conversation with Larry. She learned that he had been traveling in a red pickup truck when his father had apparently suffered a fatal heart attack, and she gathered that he was now trapped in the same vehicle, but he didn't appear to say anything else to Darlene about the vehicle having flipped over. I know it's a long shot, but perhaps many of the points which regularly get wheeled out as compelling proof that the whole story is bogus only relate to the later hoax messages and not the original, potentially genuine broadcasts. Yeah, but again, it's been 50 years. No trucks found. No matching kids missing. No child bones. Okay, well that's all fine and dandy, but let's back it down a bit and consider another serious issue here. If Larry had indeed been a real boy trapped in a real vehicle, then surely the truck and the corpses would have been found at some point over the next 50 years. Boom! Yes, Danny! And how come a connection was never made with an officially missing seven-year-old boy and his dad? I do think it's a bit sketchy that a red pickup truck was never found, although some have argued that it could still be out there somewhere in the remote wilderness of the New Mexico mountains, buried under silt or hidden away in an inaccessible ditch or ravine. As for making a connection with a boy and father listed as missing, we should remember that we never really gathered much reliable information about either of them. We're not sure of Larry's real name, or even whether he was really seven years old. He could potentially have been even younger, but had lied about his age. As I said before, very young kids have a tendency to add on a year or two when asked about their age. And it's quite possible that the father and son may have dropped completely off the grid before the accident. It may have been that the authorities weren't even aware that they were in the country, or that the father was a fugitive from justice. One popular theory is that the father may have been carrying out a parental kidnapping and that the whole hunting trip idea was just a cover story to explain to his son why they were embarking upon an epic journey across several U.S. states. Whilst I know some American families like to train their offspring to hunt from a young age, I'm not sure if it's common to start the training from as young as seven. I wouldn't say it's, I mean, maybe not for training, but if the dad's into hunting. Like, my kid's four, and I'm never going to let them... I mean, sorry, at this age, I don't mean like I'm never gonna let them, but like now, I'd never let them touch a gun. Like, there's no shot. That's insane. But to come on a hunt, I mean, I don't hunt. Is that so outrageous to like share in a hobby? I mean, it does because it's like you're shooting animals and stuff. But I don't know, America. <laughs> But whilst the police have never officially made a connection with a genuine missing persons case, I was more than intrigued to stumble across a true story which doesn't get reported very often at all. Back in the 1960s, a young couple by the name of Leon Zerfus and Jeannie Mera moved to the town of Dixon, New Mexico with their very young son. Sadly, this on-again, off-again relationship was anything but a happy one. Leon Zerfus also had on-again, off-again relationships with other women, including one with whom he'd also had a child at roughly the same time, and he often used to move around when the mood took him, hopping between Jeannie and the mother of his other child. Both Leon and Jeannie were reported to be heavy drug users and frequented a local hippie enclave to stock up on supplies. On a far more disturbing note, Jeannie later claimed that Leon was a violent and abusive man. Despite this, Jeannie and Leon later conceived a second child. Jeannie gave birth to their new daughter, Elia, in January 1970, but she was forced to stay in the Embudo Hospital in Dixon for several days following complications from the birth, and so the older son was left in the sole care of Leon Zerfus. During her stay in hospital, Leon came to visit with their son, but it was to be the very last time that Jeannie Miera ever saw her first child. When she finally returned home with her newborn daughter, she discovered that Leon had packed all of his belongings and fled the family home with their son, who was never seen again. Does he drive a red pickup truck? Does it have a CB radio? The missing boy had been living in New Mexico. He would have been seven years old in 1973 when the Lost Boy messages were broadcast, and his name was David. I know this is not the name usually associated with the cry for help, but it's still a name that was referenced frequently in the messages, including that original broadcast picked up by Darlene Ross when Larry appeared to be demanding help from somebody else on the scene with that name. Okay, so I, I didn't put that together, but the David come over here and help thing was on the original uh, potentially non-prank call, which makes me think that that original was also a prank call. I still think that. Unfortunately, any details relating to the case of David Joseph Miera, who was last seen alive in 1970, are pretty hazy, a situation not helped by the fact that it took Jeannie M Miera a whole year before she reported her son missing. Oh my god, Jeannie. Oh my god, some people, 
Some people. But it seems that the police expended little effort in locating the son of a couple of drug-using hippies. Jeannie later moved to California and had five more children, but she claims that she returned to New Mexico in 1986 and tracked down Leon Zerfus, who gave several conflicting accounts of what exactly he had done with David. Well, he'd be in his 20s. At one point he claimed that he gave him to his sister, whilst another time he claimed that he'd given David away to a group of hippies who lived in a bus. Several of Jeannie's relatives believe it most likely that David was either deliberately killed or died under Leon's dubious care. God damn. Or the child may have just been swapped for a massive bag of weed. But it doesn't seem as if Leon Zerfus was ever charged with anything and David Joseph Miero was never found. Jeannie died suddenly in 1989, whilst Leon Zerfus died in 2005 without ever revealing the true fate of David. I find it quite bizarre that nobody at any point seemed to make any kind of connection with a seven-year-old boy who occasionally used the name David who was crying out for help in New Mexico with a seven-year-old boy called David who had gone missing from New Mexico just three years earlier. It's quite a, quite a time difference. And it might just be a pretty big coincidence, but it's one that's largely ignored. Uh, I think Occam's razor here is that it's just a coincidence. It's good to hear that at least something productive emerged from a huge search and rescue operation which dragged on for four days at vast expense without yielding a single result. It did. Thanks in part to those 1973 broadcasts, the Federal Communications Commission introduced tougher rules and regulations designed to make it harder for pranksters to hide away under fake names and launched new regional CB investigation teams to handle such matters. More significantly, the case led directly to the forming of the New Mexico Search and Rescue Council the following year, which had done a fine job in ensuring that subsequent searches were less likely to descend into mayhem. According to Maj Harar from the Albuquerque Journal magazine in 1983, quoting, Larry was never found, but because of that search, numerous lives since have been saved. Search and rescue volunteers, when questioned about their dedication, say that saving a life is what makes all the long, hard hours of training worthwhile. But the jury is still out on who exactly was behind the Lost Boy Larry broadcasts. I feel quite conscious that I spent a large chunk of the script examining the potential theories on why the story may have been completely genuine. Yet if I was a betting man, I'd probably reluctantly conclude that the whole story was nothing more than a hoax, as there are still too many elements that don't quite fit together. 100% agree, Danny. Having said that, I won't share the widely held conviction that it can be conclusively dismissed as a prank. No, I mean, it's very hard to do something conclusively. I think... I was at 95, I'm probably now at 90% certain that it's a prank, which I, I guess 90% is pretty conclusive, but not fully. Nothing's, things, are, things are rarely black and white. I'm left with concerns about how the search and rescue operation was handled, how quickly it was called off, and the unexplored potential connection with the missing boy, David Joseph Mira. And it's unfortunate that we can't hear any recordings of the messages to judge for ourselves, but I'm reminded again of the words Sergeant W.A. Schmidt from the Civil Air Patrol, who expressed the opinion that if you'd heard the voice for yourself, you would be left with no doubt it was a genuine cry for help. If this was a hoax, it seems unlikely that the culprit will ever come forward after all this time to claim responsibility, unless they quite fancied the idea of getting free meals in prison. Well, they're going to be well past statute of limitations. Now, this is like 1970s. <laughs> So, are we ever likely to get a definitive answer to the mystery of the Lost Boy Larry broadcasts? Well, that'll be a negatory, good buddy. <laughs> and that's where we end today's episode. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it. If you like the show, leave a rating, leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. If you're on YouTube, like and subscribe, and I will see you next time.